say. Welcome to this week's Conversation Club. It's the Conversation Club before the Jubilee. And luckily for everybody, we've got next week off. Even Conversation Club's going to take next Thursday off to celebrate Her Majesty in the Platinum Edition, I think. So this week we've got, um, rather than asking questions, posing answers maybe. Uh, Karen Thompson and joined by Carol Still. Karen uh, was talking about and has been involved, I think, in competency work with the PMI uh, recently, uh, which is interesting stuff because the PMI seems to have broken away from a, an archaic toolbox, pin box approach and is going for a set of values to drive their, their uh, way of doing things. That is interesting. Uh, I'd like to hear quite a lot about that and see how that, that works, because that seems like a, a fairly meaningful thing. Also, Karen's going to talk to her about, us about her work on project management competency. And very, very conveniently, Carol from the University of Coventry uh, in London, and who uh, I, I, I have been working very closely with on a fusion skills oriented thing to, to take over the world. Um, is is joining Karen as part of the conversation. But uh, first, so welcome to both of you. And uh, Karen, I think you're going to kick off with a, a rough outline of what we're going to be talking about. Thank you. You need to unmute. And Dale, if you could turn your video off, please. I still can't hear you because you're still muted, Karen. Can you hear me, Karen? You're, Karen, you're muted. Karen, you're muted. Oh, I think you know, but it's not working. Right, that should have unmuted me. I've had to stop screen sharing to okay. do oh, it. What can you see? Me. Can you see my first screen? No, because I, oh, that can now, but you need to expand it again. Okay. You, 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 you put your slideshow on. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. No, I lost all the buttons, including the unmute when I put slideshow okay. on. So sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So actually in the reverse order, first of all, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back again. Thank you to Carol for joining the conversation, because I, where I want to go with this is to very much talk about what this means for education for project management, education and training. Um, but what I thought I'd just kick the conversation off with is just sharing something, a little piece of, very little piece of work that I did prior. This is really away from the PMI stuff, but it dovetails so nicely. And at the end of it, I incorporated the PMI stuff. So I'll talk just a very little bit about that. But that is very much an ongoing, and part of the PMI Global Curriculum Review Panel and we're doing a, an ongoing piece of work that hasn't yet finished, but that's it's. I'm very excited by the direction that is going. But where I started was, and I very conveniently found a paper that had already looked at 65 documents that presented project management competency frameworks of one sort or another. And they distilled, that they started with, as you can see at the bottom there, three over 3000 documents, refined that down and included in their analysis were the 65. And they came up with 81 competencies that are already documented about the competencies we need for project management. So rather than give you a list of 81, which is far too much for anybody to get their head around, I thought I would just show it as a pie chart to show you the types of competencies. So they grouped them into these groupings. So these are their, I think there are 11 groupings there. So you've got project management knowledge is the biggest chunk, it's the 18 um 18 is the number of competences in that group and then the next ones down were the communication skills so i guess we would probably describe those as traditionally as the hard skills and the soft skills but there were quite a lot of other things that would also come under that loose term of soft skills i mean it's a bit of a misnomer because that that's really the hard stuff the difficult stuff it soft suggests it's easy and of course it's not um so that is where I sort of started, <clears throat> but there's a dimension here that isn't um, 
isn't really tackled. And I'm just going to see if I can scroll on. Yes, I can. And the other piece of work that I, I sort of am in is the development of the idea of the sustainability mindset, because the this started to tease out some of the dimensions that are not really in those competencies. And I'll show you the mapping I did in a moment that shows this is where the gap is. Um, but for sustainability, um, the and this is the work done by the it's a working group of Prime, which is the United Nations Principles of Responsible Management Education. So not specifically project management, but management in general. So I've been looking at that with an interest in what does this mean for projects and project contexts? So this is the pure sort of sustainability mindset within which there are 12 principles in these four um, perspectives, if you like. So it's the idea of the ecological worldview, the systems perspective. So those of you that have um, been following the conversation club, you'll know we've all been talking about systems thinking quite a lot. Um, emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. Personally, I don't really like that language, but you probably get the drift. And what this is building on, I think, is the the, some theory that actually goes way, way back of the theory of planned behaviour, which is illustrating that behaviour is underpinned by our attitude. Attitude is the word that's often used, but that can incorporate our beliefs and values. So, yes, we can share knowledge with people, but actually how they act on that depends on not just on that knowledge, but a whole range of other things. And I was going to try and put a slide in that actually, for those that aren't familiar with the theory of planned behaviour, just to share that, but I completely failed to be able to edit my PowerPoint for reasons that I won't go into. So I'm hoping that simple explanation is enough to give people an understanding that in higher education, we have tended to focus on the knowledge and certainly project management, education and training tends to focus on delivering knowledge. But there's a big sort of hidden area, and I know Nigel talks about this as the hidden curriculum, the values and beliefs that underpin that, that some would argue that that's not part of what higher education should be doing. But whether we like it or not, we probably do do that. We either, resort, we either reinforce beliefs and values that people already have, or we reinforce the beliefs and values of our institutions, things that are just sort of implicit in what we're saying. And we don't really give a lot of attention to that. So that's why I wanted to look at sustainability mindset. And then I actually found that some of the work we'd been doing on project management and in particular the system thinking piece resonated with an awful lot of this work. So I sort of looked at this and then also looked at the responsibility, sorry, responsible management competence portfolio that you'll see actually predates the sustainability mindset. But there you'll see an, one way of looking at the sort of the different types of competences we might need. So we've got the knowledge there in the top left. Um, they actually break that intellectual competence down into knowledge and analysis and thinking. And I think that's quite helpful, quite a helpful distinction. In terms of the practical things, so this is what we might think of as skills, the things we need to be able to do. So we've got those actions, but then an awful lot of the actions we take are about interaction. And my own personal sort of definition, if you like, of uh, project management has been it was always about those interactions, those relationships I had with people. Um, that's what project management for me boiled down to. Um, but then also underpinning all of that and things we can start to articulate are what they describe as personal competences, which are either about the character, about beliefs, values and attitudes that we currently hold and who we are. But then crucially, there's also an element about self-adaptation, which is the becoming piece. And I think that's important in relation to sustainability because we don't yet know how to live sustainably on this planet. Um, so this is the... This is really focusing on the idea that you can't just tell people to, to read a book or do a course and that equips you with all the knowledge you need to do your job. It's not a the project sort of or the, the, the learning ends here. This idea of continuous development and in particular continually adapting to the context within which we find ourselves in is really, really important when it comes to projects. And I think the idea that all projects are context dependent and their management is depends on the context, is, uh, has been well argued and is well understood now. So that resonated for me. So what I did is I took those 81 competences and mapped them onto this 
understanding that came from the responsible management perspective. And you'll see these numbers here represent the number of competencies I could link to each one of these types. And you'll see there's a big fat zero under that self-adaptation. What's interesting is that there were six in the that, that alluded to be about beliefs and values and character in the, the project management competencies framework. Those were explicitly articulated. Um, and then I also mapped, I think it's probably my next slide. Yeah, here we are, the PMI principles. So the, the latest version, version edition seven of the project management body of knowledge, it is still called, um, has actually ditched all the explicit knowledge. So they, knowledge is implicit in an awful lot of what is in that new body of knowledge. Um, I'm told what they've been telling, I'm advised that what they've been telling people is that if you want to understand the knowledge, you go back to version six. I'm not sure how that's being received by the project management community yet. Um, clearly looking forward, I can't imagine that they will be um, maintaining a version six and a version seven of their body of knowledge. So already that is starting to look like a bit of a misnomer because two of their principles, specifically about being, one is to be a diligent steward, um, and the other one I can't remember off the top of my head. We can go to those in a minute if you want to. But what's interesting is the zero down the bottom there. Um, so that is still missing. Karen. What, yeah. what would you, that self-adaptation, that sounds a bit like learning how to learn. Is that is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do talk about it as conti continual yeah. professional development, CPD would be something. But I think in project management, it's particularly relevant because it's not just about the person, it's about the person in the context. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, so there's a process, where, there's a process there where, as well. I mean, are these things describing the person or are they describing the processes that they might use to to become that person? Well, this is about the competence, and this is where yeah. I was hoping Carol was perhaps going to be able to contribute to our yeah. thinking on this, because what we need to be able to do if we're going to design education to develop, um, well, to be principles-based education that actually delivers on some of these people being able to do some, well, it's not just about doing, that's the yellow box, of course, but about what they know, think, do, relate, and in particular, yeah who they are, because that in that, that's where you need to get to if you're going to talk about principles, I think. And then the self-adaptation, how do we assess that? I mean, I haven't, I haven't got an answer to that yet, but it's a really big question. And I think what's gonna become really uh, an interesting area of discussions, where, and is where I wanted to get to today, was around what does this mean? This idea that we're no longer saying, well, this is the knowledge we have to share for somebody to be well prepared as a project manager, but how do we actually deliver education and what how do we actually know i mean it's, it's carol's expression of we know good when we see it what does that actually look like part of that will be about this self-adaptation and being able to adapt to different situations so i think that's a a very very good question and it'll be interesting i think we we're probably fairly well, very, fairly good at defining competences that are about knowledge. We can test fairly readily, with it, even with exams, about what people know, how well they think about something. It takes you into a slightly different way of assessing. Certainly doing, again, we're probably quite good at assessing whether somebody can, for example, construct a coherent pl project plan. That's a doing thing. How they relate to people is probably much harder to assess. But I would argue this bottom area and this is where for a long, long time, I've always tried to involve practitioners in, my, in the classroom, because I believe this is where we need to um, be really using real examples. We, if we want to teach case studies, the very best types of case studies to use are going to be the real world examples, not just theoretical case studies or old case studies. I think for maximum learning, we want authentic learning, which is very much about um, the challenges today. And that is changing. This is what I'm saying about sustainability. We don't yet know how to live sustainably, but by crikey, we've all got to learn from each other and we've got to learn fast. So I'll just take you on to where that thinking led me, which was about um, how we might, because even, so if I just go back, six boxes or hexagrams in this case is fine, but I wanted to distill it down a little bit more Firstly, to echo the idea of the sustainability mindset, but also I did think there were some, there were four different perspectives here. So this is the perspectives and the values that we've been 
for a while now we've had in responsible project management this idea of we need to be consciously raise awareness of the intended and unintended impacts of projects and in particular we need to tease out opportunities for projects to deliver better outcomes we need to the system thinking is there that is it's reflected in the PMI principles and it's something we all of us here have been talking about for a while the other element in the PMI latest body of knowledge is they've got 12 principles and then they go to quite extensive quite extensively describe a system of value delivery and I know we've already had one discussion about this sort of framework and that word value. We need to unpick that and discuss a lot more what that might mean. And you probably need to start having that sort of discussion for every project. There probably isn't one generic answer. And then, of course, the idea that we need to collaborate and engage for decision making to be ethical and for us to be able to adapt as new knowledge comes to the fore um, is another perspective. And then, so mapping that onto competencies, where I ended up was this idea that there are the three quadrants engaging people, systems and anticipatory and uncertainty thinking and delivering value. And then this like this becoming idea, who we are, our beliefs and values. And it's not necessarily about saying that one set of values is right and one is wrong, but we need to understand where individuals are coming from with their beliefs and values and what beliefs and values they hold if we're going to actually start being able to discuss those principles and what those might mean in practice. So that's why the pink is slightly set out. So that is sort of, it's the new area that we really need to think about and how we develop people is something we need to think about there. And given that I've only got my slideshow on, I'm just gonna say, oh, that's us. Okay, let's go back. So I'd like to stop screen sharing now, if I can work out how to do that. Oh, uh, show. I'm Oh, okay. So do you, you think? Do you think, do you think embedded within responsible project manager is is a critical thinker? Absolutely, absolutely. Critical thinking is one. Sorry, I'm wishing now I'd printed off all the different sources I used for this. Critical thinking comes in. Uh, where are we? Does Here, it strike under the, thinking, the, the the intellectual competence. The critical thinking fits in there. But absolutely, it is. There's a critical element to systems and anticipatory yeah, and uncertainty. But it moves also again. It's just this. It seems to me that there's a blend of things that you have to do and the things that you are. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and so, to be a critical thinker, you've also got to be. I don't know whether the, we we call them critical debaters, but de, you know, debate is supposed to be the taking on of a persona and, uh, and representing a view without necessarily being it yourself. But being able yeah. to, to to move to one side and take on the characteristics of whatever argument or or issue you're you're putting forward, and then and then you know going back, but just to to give it that 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 critical shakeout. Um, I, I don't think we've got something called a critical debate, um, but no, it's I, it, it, it's sort of there. And as I said, but there seems to be this shift between what the person is and, and what they do. You know what their process is as well, and, and and we need to get to that. And I'm intrigued by. What the training community of the PMI are going to make of this, you know, because how the hell are they going to certify and assess this credibly? That's right. the discussion. I'd be really yeah. interested in that because uh, yeah. because maybe they've got a huge plan, but I'm I'm, I'm intrigued as to know what they might be putting forward. So maybe it's time for Carol to lead in a bit. Yes, thank thank you. Um, great segue into going back to we know it when we see it, um, and I, I was reflecting on this earlier on that it was 58 years ago uh, that this uh, sort of phrase came into being um, and it, it came from a legal ruling uh, with um, Justice Potter Stewart in Ohio in 1964 who was asked to rule on a case of pornography um, and he wasn't willing to describe what it meant for him and he said I know it when I see it and someone else will know it when they see it and what they see and what I see may be different and that's okay. Well, you know, it, it may be for something like pornography, but it's absolutely not when we come to assessing these competencies. Um, and Karen, to your point about um, it, education has always assessed knowledge and, and that's because it's, it's relatively easy to assess knowledge. Um, but where we are now, 
particularly in higher education, where we are required to deliver graduates who have got the competencies uh, that, you know, the project management competencies and the, the, the marketing competencies, you know, call them what you like in, in terms of which industry. Um, uh, and, and yet, it, unless we collectively as a community are brave enough to put on paper what we mean by a particular competency at a level at which it can be taught, practiced and assessed, education is, is going to be continually forced down the, the route of assessing knowledge and not assessing, uh, you know, what might otherwise be the hidden curriculum. Uh, so it's about finding a language that we can commonly agree on. Uh, and, and, it, and if we can't, then we need to keep going until we can, because it's not good enough to say, well, I know it when I see it and you might know it when you see it and what you see and what I see will be different and that's OK. It's not OK. And it I agree. And whether we should all the time. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, see Adrian's be... got, I see Adrian's got his hand up. I, I missed it a little bit earlier. Are you still there, Adrian, or is this you scarpering for five minutes? <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, sorry, inevitably, I'm, di I'm diving in. Sorry about that. It's my ego. Uh, first of all, a thing I really, really liked, Karen. Uh, is the uh, the three, I'm not going to call them levels, I nearly did, the three sort of aspects of the competency, the intellectual, the practical and the personal, that resonates so well actually um, with the, R the APM's RPP assessment process, uh, which um, I'm, I'm less familiar with its chartered assessment, which I think is somewhat less flexible, but I, if, if anyone knows about more about it than I did, I decided not to get on with that. But I was an assessor for about six years, and we definitely looked at at the intellectual, shall we say, the knowledge side, breadth and depth of uh, professional knowledge. We certainly were testing practical uh, experience, but especially we were looking at the last part, the personal bit, which which was the the ability to adapt. Um, the pre the, the other two, uh, and that to me was is is the true mark of a professional. And frankly, whether it's in project management or any other sphere, it's it's the one who it's, it's the, those who've got the ability to adapt what they know to the project and indeed to the organisation. So that's that's an observation number one. Brilliant, love that. I think it's spot on. Secondly, and it arises from the organizational thing, I don't agree with you said that sort of the project context is 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 kind of well understood. I wish it was. If that was if that was really the case, huge numbers of project professionals wouldn't find themselves fighting daily with the organizations in which they're trying to get their projects to survive, let alone thrive and this is the kind of thing which um i can never remember his name properly I always get it wrong the ex-chair of the pmi with his uh, project economy um um, um what's it nieto rodriguez yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and which he's written about it extensively and you know needing to get to that kind of uh, uh, uh culture so I, I i wish that i wish that was the case <laughs> and just one other and just one final uh, sort of thing really um, I'm, where you had the sort of the collaborative and engagement quadrant, um, I, I'm not I'm not sure that's that's really the case because it rather assumes that most sort of project relationships are collaborative and engaging. And I'm 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 not from construction background, but in the construction industry, that's 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 the opposite of the of the standard case where, where it's a highly combative. Um, and I hate the word engagement anyway. It's like stakeholder management. You don't, you know, you might engage with stakeholders, but you always, always manage them. That's me. Shut up, Adrian. Go away. No, thank you very much, Adrian. I must apologise. I didn't make myself clear about context. I didn't, absolutely did not mean the context was well understood. I meant the argument that projects are context dependent. 
was well we we we, we I think I mean that was that came out of the rethinking initiative back in 2002 three that projects are dependent on the context sorry I didn't mean it was well understood but the fact that we have to take account of that I think is increasingly part of the project management and in fact one of the PMI principles is about tailoring and tailoring the whatever method you adopt to the situation so that's that's embedded there um and again on, on your second point I wonder if that again is just how I've expressed it it wasn't meant to imply that the relationships were collaborative but we only achieve anything by engaging with other people and whether that collaboration is beneficial or detrimental it's all about those interactions and certainly that was my personal experience as a professional project manager was you couldn't do anything you're not doing the project yourself and I was just to explain to students obviously doing a, a one person project is hugely different and I wouldn't call that project management necessarily in some cases there are some aspects of project management you might learn just from managing yourself but mostly you are as you were saying about managing other people but managing suggests an element of control and I think what we're trying to recognize and again this is using different language maybe but is I think very widely understood I think I think APM even moved away from stakeholder management to talk about stakeholder engagement because you can't control the idea isn't you can control and I've long been talking about the fact that we need to move away from the idea of sort of leading from the front and control and it's it's this um I know Andrew, a number of conversations ago, had a lovely illustration of the, the um, Neptune staircase, that sort of gated approach where you could just control things from one stage to the next. In actual fact, the idea of a project emerging, and that's emerging <clears throat> not just from the project manager, that's a whole the whole community that's involved in delivering the project and who will be, I mean, we've been talking about use recently with um, Phil's prub, the idea that use of results is what delivers the benefits. It's that whole network of people that are involved in achieving something that we need to be, be aware of and work, work within that. We can't necessarily control everything, but we can, um, so I don't know what word to use, um, engage, collaborate. But Influence. Facilitate, I guess, is the word I often come back to. That facilitating. Yeah, we're probably going to have to agree to disagree on that particular one, but I, we 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 may have an entire session on that on that particular one. But thanks mm. ever so much indeed. Cheers. Okay, thanks, Adrian. I'd I'd like to pick up on um, uh, Adrian's points um, and uh, both agree and and raise it to another level. Um, uh, when we look at the intellectual, practical and personal, and I think that is a neat way of um, of separating them um, at a conceptual level, that the challenge for educators comes in at the level of assessment because they are so interlinked. So, I mean, if you look at the um, practical competence, you know, interaction, well, that that is absolutely connected with the personal competence of character. So which which are you assessing at what point? Are you assessing character or are you assessing practical competence? And how, if, if you are intentionally separating them, then where does one stop and one start? Um, and in the world of assessing, we have to be in higher education, Karen, as, as you will know, um, we have to be so specific in our language now uh, in terms of what a student can expect to gain from their degree. So we have to be absolutely explicit on learning outcomes at the module level and learning outcomes at the course level. And if we're not sufficiently explicit, then the regulatory body that we have that's been imposed on us by the government, the Office for Students, will will come in and um, uh, and railroad us. Um, so the more we are forced from a regulatory perspective to be specific, the more we need industry to be brave enough to nail their colours to a particular mast um, and say what they mean at the level of personal competence and what they mean at the level of practical competence. And it's OK for elements to be in each one. It's about which one um, is being preferenced at the point of assessment. Um, because that means you can then have a whole uh, language 
bank, if you like, on, on what personal competencies might mean at the level of self-adaptation. And they can be in the same bank as the, the um, practical competence at the level of action. But if we are preferencing practical competence in an assessment, then that's what we focus on. But we're drawing from the same language bank. And that's that's where I think we can at least start to overcome some of these hurdles. Yeah, I think my personal perspective at this point in time would be that we're not necessarily going to try and assess character or assess, assess adaptation, but that as educators, we need to shift our thinking from and, and recognise the element or the component those things play in what people do, what determines what they do. But I do notice we've got a lot of educators in our um, audience, although I see Bob's got his right. hand up. Steve, I guess you might want to go to Bob next, but there Bob, are a lot Bob, of educators. Bob's a racist. <laughs> um, I would love to hear I, from other educators. Let, let yeah. Bob have a go first and then we'll get to Andrew. No, no, it's interesting stuff. I just wondered where in your diagrams and categories you'd put the drive. The, the, the whatever it is that actually you've got the ability to make other people really get up and go and do it in time and get it finished, you know, because it's all very well having a chat and collaborating and all the rest of it. But if you've got deadlines, then people have got to get off their butts and get the work done and sometimes do a bit extra to get there, you know. I think the motivation came in the character piece in the responsible management framework. Can I just well, comment on that? I, I worked many hundreds of years ago, I worked on a project with a very um, wise old project manager. And um, wh whereas I was probably too thoughtful and too careful and too considerate, uh, one day he asked me into his office and told me to start swearing and shouting at the um, at one of our suppliers. And I said, well, I don't need to do that. He's, he's actually on schedule at the moment and the rest of it. He said, look, you always need to shout at him. And, you know, I was going to use a few words that he did, but I mean, he always deserves it. How do I know you're doing doing your job unless you do it now in front of me? So so I had to pick the phone up and I'd start shouting at him and tell him he was useless and wish I'd never met him and all these kind of lines that I'd learned, you know, by working in the kind of hard world. But the but the, and now I phoned him up later and apologised and he knew what I was up to, I expect. But the but the but the point was it wasn't that that was my personality. It was that that was part of something that he wanted me to have and he hadn't actually seen it you know so i had to do both but the, but it's just a bit nebulous this drive thing you know to get things done some people do it some way some people do it in the kind of use a hammer way which he was trying to train me to do but i mean how do you kind of measure that and get i mean i would only say and i'm sure i'm wrong because carol's saying you've really got to assess it from an academic point of view as as you're going through the degree process but as a practitioner, you'd assess it to see whether they can actually get projects done on time and in practice without necessarily knowing how it is they do it. But whatever it is they do tends to work. And I expect that might be as best you're going to get from industry. I don't know. But um, sorry. Think, what you've described there is um, is a cultural issue and it was somebody's view of what good looks like and they wanted to impose that on others. So yeah, I, I, I really agree with you, Bob. It's about whether you can get the project delivered on time and the, the how may be down to personal things, but it's get, and this, this is a discussion to be had, isn't it? How much do we want to, I'm not in favour of one size fits all and everybody going about things in the same way, um, but it's about how much can we assess, how much should we assess um, and where do we draw the line? Anyway, do, do you think part of the um, <laughs> when you're training people in a degree, then I, well, also I went on a Dale Carnegie course once and we had to have sessions doing all kinds of different play acting. But one of them was standing in a room and shouting at people. I just wondered if, you know, those kind of extreme things are part of the makeup that you have to train people and they have to pass a test in it. I think you might find some ethical issues there in higher education. <laughs> Uh, I, think the world is, I think we have largely moved on. I think certainly the culture when I first started work, which was probably a similar length of time ago, has changed completely. That whole idea of it being acceptable. Mind you, having said that, some of the stories we hear coming out of government, it sounds like there's still some bullying yeah, that goes uh, on. Uh, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is moving on. <laughs> anyway, you've got more hands up, Steve. All right, Roz. Is that Roz Lishman? Hi, hi. Hello. I thought I'd say hello, Carolyn. Hello. Carolyn hi, knows me lots. 
Um, I'll try and put a little pitch in because I can see Darren's on the call as well. I live just down the road, really good at project management and I'm searching for a new job. Um, currently at risk at De Montfort University. <laughs> there you go. But I do a lot of work with Karen um, uh, as Karen's our external for, on our project management course at De Montfort University. And um, she's aware of the work that I do. I've got a, a module called Project Management Skills. Uh, at the moment and it's all about competences and I get the students to engage with the APM competence framework and we talk about emotions and we're talking about you know at the moment over the year we've got 200 odd students from mostly international students so if if a little spark of something can go back to wherever they've come from in the world and then thinking a little bit more responsibly about some of the, the projects um, but it's quite difficult, um, as you say, to capture that into an assessment criteria. Um, I'm marking them at the moment and it's it's driving me crackers. But but anyway, but they do have 10 percent of their, their mark on responsible project management. And Karen, the 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 um, the the references you were just using now, you'll see in people and in our students assignments uh, when you come to do the external examining. But um, and I also get students to make a pledge uh, or I encourage them to make a pledge and that's part of uh, how I'm assessing as well is their their wish and their their aspirations and actually a lot of them are finishing off their assignments with making a pledge to be responsible project managers and then we've got something new in the pipeline so we've got a new course that we're just developing and we're going to have a whole module a module called responsible project management so and that's quite exciting as well to to see how we're embedding that within within this new curriculum so I'm happy to to share more about what I'm doing uh, and how we're we're embedding that into into our courses. Thank you, Rose. And thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, oh, 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 so the other thing I will share, if you if you like as well, one thing we did a few weeks ago and Karen participated was like a student takeover, and they had they broke out into different groups, create different artifacts around responsible project management. So it's sent them off uh, doing stuff and creating stuff. Rose, do you have any sort of summary summarization of the your perspective and take on skills in project management that you could be will be able to share perhaps um i guess it's yeah i suppose it's a hard one because i had a student a couple of years ago i didn't didn't think i need to come to this module because it's a skills module um but it's <laughs> You know, it like it's it's one of these zero credit ones. And it, no, no, oh. it's 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 a fifteen credit module, and and really it's an opportunity to to say it's about project me. So it's where where you've been, what what you're doing now, and where you plan to be. So it's a little bit embedded careers within it, um, and it's really getting them to engage with the, the language. I mean, we use the APM one because that's I suppose nearer in some ways, um, but in the middle of the academic year, they they change it from twenty seven competencies to 29 and they're using an online version rather than an old PDF and it's made my assessment go really wobbly um, but I think getting the students to think about and engage with those it's not a language that they would normally know about and so I get them to think about the importance of knowing about competencies and how how that can help them individually personally how it can help the, their teams their organizations etc so it, it's it's kind of bringing in what you may do maybe on a HRM module or organizational management module. Um, I'm embedding that within within our within our course, within our uh, modules themselves. So it's that awareness that they won't have had ordinarily on most of their, their journeys. And it will help them with the students that is going into employability, that they've then got that connection and, and awareness of, of competence frameworks. I was going to say, surely what we're talking about, and, I, and I've tested the fact that, you know, many of the success, the, the tropes of behaviour for successful project delivery aren't just about projects. You know, they, they transcend project management as such because they can be found in almost most social interaction, you know, whether it's whether it's in, yeah. in employment or or in just at school. Um, if, if school children, are, 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 you know, they're delivering value of some sort. Um, so, so, and engaged in interaction, you know. So it's it's kind of like, do you, do you ever think that what you're looking at in training could could be extended beyond the project management course as such, and into other areas, into well, onto almost any other degree where there's a, vo a, vo a potential vocational aspect to it. 
absolutely yeah and I think that's you know it's sort of that's why I guess in some ways some of the, the work that I do is seen as good practice because we're bringing yeah. in uh, we're bringing in uh, Sam Parr who's our um, postgraduate careers advisor so it's kind of seen as a as a good practice piece yeah. but but I mean I shared with our students around um, the emotions around project management because I'm on the project board at the moment for the university for a virtual learning replacement uh, project and I and I'd kind of shared with them how it one day when I was asked to look at all of these documents and I'm a part of that governance process and I'd been given so many documents amongst everything else that I was doing and I just couldn't physically do it and I went went home and hid under the duvet um, for, for that day and and that was about what really happens if you're managing that project and if somebody does that to you and how does that impact on that scoring and that procurement process etc and how does that play out in in your in your project so so yeah i do probably go into some different places to maybe talking about gantt charts or whatever <laughs> they yeah. might be doing elsewhere well it's interesting you mentioned employability because again there's a, a bridge there uh, i think because it is very much those, those skills that, that, that tend to be you know figure very very high when when one's doing an assessment of what what what, I, what, I, what are employable skills and that's the sort of thing that opens the door to have proper maybe more constructive uh, conversations with with employers you know with resources with the hr community the talent community to to say if we could actually stabilize the definition you know and agree that we're working along the you know at two different ends of the same bridge um it could it could actually be exceedingly productive i could sorry just share one other thing with you yeah. as well because obviously we do embedded within that is the uns sdgs which is something we do within the university as well by sort of doing my teaching and my students have because of rpm because of talking about UNSDGs, I know they've got employment as a result of that because they were able to articulate that in their interviews. So that's a really, a really good one um, to, yeah. to to share as well. Yeah, no, good, good point. Carol. Uh, Steve, thanks. Um, to your point on the transversibility um, of uh, of skills and how they're assessed. Um, I think it would be it would be helpful, you know, if collectively the the um, employment community um, of um, institutions, um, educational institutions, professional bodies, um, and and indeed the policymakers, all adopted the same type of language. So, for example, the intellectual competence, personal competence, and practical competence um, it is clearly not. Uh, just anchored to project management, but but they are transversal qualities, if you like. Um, and, and then it's agreeing, well, what do they mean in the context of a particular industry or a sector within that industry? Um, and we, we can start to get some alignment there if, if we can uh, agree to not disagree, I think is where we would probably get to with it because we're not going to get everybody agreeing on the same thing uh, and that's impractical mm -hmm. but i think if we can agree not to disagree yeah well that's what, we that's, what we, to get that's what we do in the world of standards we seek consensus uh, and yeah. that means that not everybody agrees but it, you know it's a, there, there, there's a degree of tolerance in there but yeah. uh, by the same token it's something that we can live with mm. uh, in, in the full knowledge that things change and evolve yeah. Um, uh, uh, or there's a revolution as well as an evolution, so that the standard that you agree to at least gets the it gets the bus going, you know, mm. so that it, it's moving. And, and then in two or three years time, in the light of experience, because you're learning by doing, in a sense, mm. you, you, you can transform it, you can you can change it. So that, that, again, is something that's you know a critical feature of making progress on this, this. And so that's why, in a sense, I'm really interested in how the hell can we leverage what PMI are doing without thinking PMI thinking that we were doing a land grab. Um, because, you know, it, it tends to it tends to throw up a turf war uh, yeah. and that's not the way this is going to get sorted out. It's particularly when it's going to be as as it should be public commons, really, um, yeah. full stop, you know, uh, yeah. and just used universally to play to Andrew because he, he's interested in the universe. But um, Karen, uh, uh, did, did you want to invite any any other academics to say anything or I, I'm interested in what you're going to do with the competence framework now you've done that analysis Who, where's it where are you hoping to place that or, or, or use that um, well I think where it'll be used in the first instance is to help us develop some learning outcomes for some workshops we want to run um, who RPM yeah 
yeah, yeah okay. we've got ideas yeah. about some workshops so i wanted to sort of do that thinking to try mm. and anchor in some way rather than just sort of pulling um ilos yeah. out of the thin air i yeah. wanted to try and have a framework within which to put them and I, I think the question about assessment is really important so i'm not yes. advocating that as an assessment framework and i think that's carol's no point. but I, I i think it was a really good analytical tool to say well look there's this space here which is the as it uh, the 2b bit you know the the, the, the development mental part where there's nothing and yet you know that seems to be the crucial dare I say fulcrum or whatever it is, if a fulcrum does that sort of thing, that, that enables uh, the person and, you know, it's in, we're into actualization and, uh, and I don't know, autonomization, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, and yet there's nothing there. And there's nothing there ostensibly in, in, in a revamped approach to project management by the largest project management body on the planet. So there, there's a lack somewhere uh, that, 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 that could, could and should be filled. And would, would you be aiming to do that or to champion that in some way? I mean, have you put that back to them, to the, um, this analysis? Uh, I'm just trying to remember whether I actually shared Maybe. it with, with, yeah. the, with the panel or not. But of course, we're not designing a curriculum for responsible no. management. We are obviously taking the body of knowledge, but there is recognition within PMI just how revolutionary that new body of knowledge is. Yeah. It's sort of a slip. I mean, it's it's slipped out um, yeah. in terms of that is the published body of knowledge, which has got no knowledge in at all. Um, and certainly on our committee, we are, and the, the chair is saying this is revolutionary. And obviously I fully agree with that. And I think we, when we are looking, but, but interestingly, I think I shared this with you the other day, a lot of our discussion is, is about the bits that are not even traditionally considered part of project management. It's about the what comes first and what comes after project management. Um, so I don't know what, in, what learning outcomes will come out with them. We're looking at the challenges that people face, a very, very different approach, I think, that is gonna be quite, quite revolutionary. I'm sort of inputting to that. Um, back, back to, yeah, I know that there are several people on the call who I'm awfully tempted to invite them to talk. But I don't want to embarrass anybody. Oh, go on. There's somebody who was on the Sustainability Mindset Action Lab with me who might wish to comment. And I can also see at least one person, one person who is on the PMI Curriculum Review Panel as well. And of course, we had an RPM, uh, we shared it with some of the RPM people. And I can see somebody else who was there for that. So I don't know if anybody else, Adrian's got his hand up again. So I guess we could go back to Adrian. <laughs> Go on, okay, just a, a couple of things. I want to come back to what Carol was saying. It was extremely interesting about the, uh, the common language challenge, which she completely right about. And I think almost there are there are sort of um, uh, there are sort of two ends of that. One is the challenge with the C-suite, first of all, getting them to uh, engage with projects seriously to start with, because the vast majority of the C-suite don't come from a project's background. They come from a business as usual background and they don't get projects head and heart. So that's that's a problem. They've actually got to want to engage with projects and understand them, to understand therefore what they need to do to create, if uh, back to our, our, our organizational environment, to get to a creative environment which they can, projects can thrive. The other kind of end of that is the academic scale. And coming back to another piece of work uh, not too long ago, which again, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez did sort of a, uh, I think he says himself it's a fairly quick and dirty survey, but he rather shockingly found that project management was only a core part of a very small percentage of, of, of MBAs internationally. Um, and um, one of which he cited in the UK was the Side Business School, which is a um, wonderful business school, but project management appears as an option within an option in that, which is according according to him and i've had a, went off and had a quick look and i was quite shocked at that is that uh, true so of course if, if project management is only going to be an, an option within an option in an mbas what what possible hope have we got to train people doing mbas uh, which is supposed to, which, which is obviously a, a much higher and practical level of education um you know how what what, what can we do with undergrads let alone people doing MBAs. Well, interesting point. And that, so you, you looked at the side curriculum too, did you, Adrian? I did, and I can't off the top of my head, because I, th I thought I'll check that that one. And when I, when I went to look at it, it, it looked to be 
how at least how it was presented on their on their sort yeah. of, uh, uh, curriculum website to be an option within an option. Yeah, because I think we all make that that assumption that it must be about project management, particularly major project delivery. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, twenty it's, years it's, ago, it's, I surveyed every UK MBA, and yeah. at that time, I think only two MBAs available actually had any project management in them. Right. Vast amounts of fantastic stuff about how to build a strategy, especially a strategy for change, nothing at all about how to deliver it. Now, mm -hmm. that has changed massively. And I know this because I, te I teach at a few business schools and, and would love to teach more, by the way. Um, but but it's but if it's not part of the core, for me, that's that's a that, that's a that's a challenge. How do we how do we make that change? Well, we still need to break all those boundaries down, don't we? Indeed. Yeah. Um, OK, well, thank you for that observation. I hadn't quite um, looked at it or thought about that for a while uh, in that context. So Karen Cripps, hello. Hello, just saying Hi. a quick hello because I was on the sustainability mindset diploma oh. course with Karen that she just mentioned. So everything that I've heard here has been absolutely fascinating. It's what I'm trying to do in my own courses at the University of Winchester where I'm not specifically teaching on project management but what I've really taken away from this is that these are the kind of competencies that I can embed into my general management teaching that I'm very much looking for and needing to I think it is as you've said a really generally applied framework that can be effectively used and it also strikes me that when I'm looking for how to embed the, the competencies, the mindset, both into teaching activities and assessment and taking on board what you've said, Carol, also with the need for things to be specific, yeah. how to do it. I Is there any alignment, do you think, Karen, between the Education for Sustainable Development competency framework by the United Nations, which the QAA have adopted also in its ESD strategy? because that's something that I've been looking towards alongside the mindset to think it can be the structure to, to bring it into my modules. I'm sorry, I haven't actually looked at I, that. That's uh, Thank you for mentioning that, because that's actually something else I could try and map onto the framework I've um, I've come up with there. Um, I suppose I wanted to ask you, you really, I don't know whether you've, as part of the work you're doing, you've had a look at the 12 principles from the PMI, I wonder what you thought of those, because they are an odd mix of things. There are two that clearly are about character. They talk about being something, but they're a really strange mixture of things. But I don't know whether you've got a view or whether you've even looked at them yet. That might be. But I'll, I'll take your reference and go and have a look at that framework and see how that maps on. Um, a lot of other stuff, a lot of stuff I've seen. And I think we had this discussion on the mindset thing. 17 sustainable development goals is 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 overwhelming. And again, I know. Um, I'm trying to remember if it was Rosie's students or other students. I think it might have been the students at Southampton that I was talking to. Um, clearly, any one project isn't necessarily going to hit all of those or even more than one, maybe. My concern was always that you might be aiming to achieve one SDG goal and actually be doing harm in relation to others. So I think that's something we need to look at at projects. Um, I was talking yesterday with Nigel and we were talking about um, all projects needing to look at how the, the social impact, um, especially on projects where we're creating new value, how that might be distributed more equally. Redistributing value that is already in the system is gonna be very challenging because people don't like to give up what they've got. But the idea of when we're doing something new that we can look at how we might be more um, equitable in who benefits from that is something certainly projects can take on board. So I probably haven't answered your question at all, but I will take away your reference. <laughs> So thank you, Karen. Thank you for sharing your thank thoughts. You. I'll get in touch with you. We'll discuss further. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. Carol, closing remarks, maybe. Thank you. Well, a, a thought just occurred to me that um, it, in looking at what universities are required to do in service of their students and in service of employability, and looking at what employers are required to do in service of their own employees in terms of appraisals, if we can each understand the other's worldview a little more, then perhaps we can get a lot closer, a lot faster. Because these, you know, the, the personal competencies, the intellectual, practical and personal that you were talking about, Karen, 
um, it's equally applicable in an appraisal system as it is in an assessment system in universities. And, and yet there, there is currently no bridge between the two. And if we could start to build that bridge, then perhaps we, we have the language there, we just don't realise we have it there. Yeah. So that's, that's my thought for the day. Yeah, that's a good one. Mm. Karen? Um, well, yes, I completely agree that exploring that would be very interesting. I think I just come back to, and I think this was, well, I don't know if it was Bob's argument, but certainly what Bob's, Bob's uh, critique was um, flagging. I And again, I think Adrian and I have had discussions about this. Um, I, I, it's not one size fits all, which is why I think I'm, I'm very nervous about this idea about assessing beliefs and values. But I think as educators, we do need to surface and discuss those things perhaps far more. Um, so let's say where I think this all goes next is all around what is a principles based education? What are the implications of PMI taking a principles based approach? APM haven't quite gone that far, but it sounds like I might need to go to the next level in having a look at their competency frameworks. I only looked at the sort of the top level. Um, I couldn't find anything in there that was really there wasn't very much about character or be or um, of the becoming piece. So I think they're sort of. Well, it, I, say, I certainly think the PMI, the, the principles based um, yeah. approach is going to shape things up a bit and how we actually educate for that um, and how we assess it. That will be a whole nother question. OK, thank you for that. Uh, this, this might uh, I'm going to kind of close because uh, we're not going to go talking for another hour. But what what hasn't been discussed today, I, although Bob was getting near it, I think, and, and possibly Adrian. It, it's the culture, it's the organisational culture, because you can send the most bright eyed and bushy tailed person who's, you know, thirsting to, to, to do well into an environment that crushes the life out of them after a few weeks or a few months. Um, you know, uh, we're seeing we, we see we, we see examples and feel examples of that all over the place still. And if the, and if the if the culture within an organisation is wrong or there isn't some means of within what you're discussing and preparing, Karen, um, it's this consideration of how does the culture transform as well? Or, or what, what is it that needs to be done in tandem with, with uh, introducing these ideas as well? Because I can see that culture could be one of the biggest blockers to making these things work. Um, albeit indeed that there are many tick boxes and you know there are places in Westminster um, not too far away where there's lots of tick box oh yes we do that we're outward facing and diverse and speak unto power and all of that and god help you if you do it um, because the culture is still prevailingly you know of a status quo and big and little c conservative um, it won't allow it it won't permit it um, there, you know, there's so much vested interest elsewhere. And yet again, it's imperative that that changes, although there is undoubtedly a dynamic relationship between taking people who wish to behave differently into those environments and maybe what could be done to facilitate or simplify uh, and, uh, and, uh, and make easier that, 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 that transition into those environments whilst changing them at the same time. And, and maybe we, we could have a bash at talking about that in a, in a few weeks time as well, if that, if that sounds of interest. Personally, I'm allergic to that word culture because I think what I think you're well, partly talking about is... I can tell you a joke about culture if you want, but no, I won't. No. <laughs> organisational no, norms, and that is one of the... Um, if you look at the theory of planned behaviour, it's those organisational norms. Yeah. And as you know, RPM is about the focus on the okay. individual. Well, so what do you... Going what, what, hand, hand in hand, you, organisational change. What do you use instead of culture, then? Well, I say organisational norms, norms of behaviour, yeah. it's those external okay. influences. Yeah, well, that's, that, that's fine. But, I, 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 that, I, you know, that is a massive thing to take into account. You wouldn't... Sure. You know, you, you know, you walk into a building and you can feel almost immediately what it's like. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, then you have to balance that against what you're trying to do or what you're setting out to do. And whilst it sounds great, um, it, it, it's it's almost doomed to failure. Um, in the first instance, if, if that kind of, I don't know, manual, maybe, maybe it's again senior management engagement, Adrian, you know, getting, getting the uh, the project managers at the, the board table or with project, no, not, not the project managers at the board table, but the 
for the board with project skills. I think that's mm -hmm. the that's, that's the goal. I, I I nearly came in on sort of the culture again. It's one uh, yeah. Karen and I could go yeah. around for hours. Of, no, 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 yeah, no, you know no, what I mean. No. It's, it's the look and the feel of it. I know I I know it when I see it. That's what I say. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> I, I write a lot about it in my new book, by the way. Oh, you've got a new book out, have you? <laughs> oh, has it been delivered? Uh, no, it's apparently it's coming tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I've just got late. a message. Very, yeah. very annoying. I want it in my hands. Yeah, and it's about, agil it's about agility, isn't it? And your book's late. What's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, it's perfectly on time, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's because you don't have a baseline. That's the thing. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, OK, right. Well, that was a fascinating discussion. Um, as I said, yet again, one that will continue and we'll find excuses for it. So I'm going to close it there with the um, uh, the indication that firstly, I, I'm, we are doing a, a live face to face uh, conversation club meeting on the 20th of June. I have been circulating members of the club with information about that. Please come back to me if you, you wish to either take, come along or, or not. But it's, a, it's one of the most powerful networking evenings that you will ever experience. I, I kid you not. And the next day we're, we're again, I think we've got a, a sort of skills agenda with the PACE group, the Cross Westminster Estimating Group the following day as well, which some of us are participating in. So there's that. Uh, we have our Jubilee holiday. So there's no conversation club next week. Um, and we bow to the crown on that one. Uh, but the following week, you will be delighted to know that Phil Driver is coming back to complete the New Zealand Trilogy on Benefits. And we will be starting to talk about the language of benefits, its taxonomy and things like that. So again, there's a there's a bleed into to what we've been talking about today as a solution. So look forward to seeing you then. Week off next week, June the 9th, Phil Driver back again and um, have a very safe and pleasant week ahead or fortnight. Take, take the fortnight off. <laughs> See you then. Goodbye. <laughs>